America fear their government, and the government is being run by too many powerful agencies like the IRS and others, I think it's time that people take the country back through their representative government. Welcome to Freedom TV. We've got another week and another great show for you. We're going to be speaking to Bob Ekstrom, and we're going to be talking about the unlicensed marriage or how you can divorce the state. That's going to be coming up shortly. But first, I'd like to talk to you about a segment that we have every once in a while, and this one is called Political Prisoners. This is a segment that we bring up to show and highlight certain individuals and people who have been incarcerated for what we call non-crimes. These are people who have been put to the test, and some of them are from all the way around the world. And the one that we have this week is going to be Sherry Peel Jackson. And this is, again, there's our segment, Political Prisoners. You can see exactly what we're talking about, people who have been incarcerated. This is Sherry Peel Jackson, and we're encouraging people to go to the website and send an email offer some support, either emotional support, find out where you can send Sherry Peel Jackson a letter. The, she was the person who was highlighted in Aaron Russo's America Freedom to Fascism, and she was a very, very courageous IRS person who stood up and said, show me the money, I mean, show me the law. And she never did get the law. She fought this and has been in jail for quite a long time. So that's Sherry Peel Jackson. And if you can send her some support, send her, you know, just an email or a letter, something that lets them know that we still think about her out here. The next thing I'd like to tell you about is something coming up next Saturday. This is called an open candidate call. This is sponsored by the Republican Party, but this is open to any party of any political persuasion, or even if you don't even belong to party. If you've ever thought of running as a candidate, and we're kind of concerned about, well, how does this all work? What do I do? Where do I get the information? Come to this meeting. It's two hours, and you'll get every single thing you need to know to start a campaign, how to run a campaign, where all the rules and the laws and, and the, the things you have to file and report on. Everything that you're going to need is going to be in this two-hour session. So, again, it's open to any political persuasion. You don't have to be a Republican, but the Republican Party of Oregon is the one who's putting it on, particularly here in Multnomah County. So we're encouraging everyone, don't care what county you're from. If you're from, you know, Tillamook County and you want to come down and participate in this and learn how you, too, can be a candidate and have your say, join us for the open candidate call, and that's going to be next Saturday from 10 to 12. Two hours of your time. You're going to get lots of information. You're going to get a CD with all kinds of stuff you can take home and peruse the Internet or look at at your leisure. So that's our information for today. And now we're going to be going to our regular segment, which is Surviving and Thriving. This week we've brought back Gene Ward. And we're going to be talking a little bit about survival kits, just your basic kind of survival kits. And also he's going to be talking about interesting ways that you can split wood that you may not have thought about. So without further ado, we're going to be going to Surviving and Thriving with Gene Ward. If you become lost, what you should do is stop and get control of those emotions. 
take an inventory of what you've got to work with. Get organized and develop a plan of action that's going to get you and yours through this night safely. Without a survival kit, it's going to be very difficult to get control of your emotions. The mind just doesn't want to work well when it's consumed by fear. What you're most likely going to do is to continue to try to keep getting back to your vehicle, even though you have no idea where that's at. The goal of this video is to show you that a small survival kit can keep these nights from becoming life-threatening. Of all the tools that I stock in my survival kit, the one item that I use the most and place the highest value on is my knife. The knives that I've been carrying for years are the Leatherman Wave and the Swiss Army Huntsman knife. The one item that both of these have in common is a good saw blade on it. Almost everything that I do out here, everything that I manufacture, everything that you see in any of my films were all manufactured with one of these two items. I place such a high importance on knives that I actually carry both of these with me. Of the two knives, I give the Leatherman Wave a little bit higher mark. The blades are much more accessible, and they lock, and that's an important safety feature. One of the really cool tricks I learned when I was down in Panama from the instructors down there was how to split a piece of wood like this using your knife. Saw halfway through the wood and just give it a good wrap on a rock and you've got a nice split piece of wood. The one survival skill that I can teach you, which I believe will have the greatest impact on keeping you alive out here, is fire. Since I began my career as a survival instructor in 1968, the one thing that has made fire starting both easy and 100% certain has been pitch wood. The dark veins that look like strips of lean bacon in this old fir stump are real good indicators that my fire starting efforts are going to be successful regardless of the weather conditions. It will be my nose, however, that will tell me for sure. That pine saw odor that I detect, that's pure gold. My approach to starting fires hasn't changed in over 30 years. First, I form a V with two arm-sized pieces of wood. This gives my small fire the protection it needs from the wind. Second, I scrape a small pile of shavings directly from the handle of my fire starting tool, which I developed in 2004. By holding the top edge of the attached scraper at a 45 degree angle and applying firm downward strokes, I can easily produce some excellent tinder. Third, I place the ferrocerium rod, also known as mish metal, directly over the pile of tinder and press slowly and firmly downward. If I'm fortunate enough to have found a source of pitch wood nearby, I will add several thin shavings just to kick it up a notch, so that when I add my handful of small dead twigs, they will ignite even if they are slightly damp. I cannot stress enough the importance of preparing kindling ahead of time, especially in wet weather. Several gradually increasing sizes of kindling will make the difference between success and failure. In addition to being one of the most reliable fire starters on the planet, the SOS fire starter can also be used successfully by survivors who have been injured. The SOS fire starter can easily be used one-handed if you have a saw blade. Welcome back to Freedom TV. Hope you enjoyed that little segment of how to survive in the forest or the woods. And now we're going to come to Bob Ekstrom from the Constitution Party. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really glad you could come and talk to us. And our subject today is going to be the unlicensed marriage. And I have to ask you, I know you're married, I'm married. Whatever possessed you to get into finding out about how to divorce the state? <laughs> Well, um, 
like most people, um, when my wife and I decided to marry, it was because we loved each other, not because we loved the state. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, we didn't get very far in proceeding down the normal steps yeah. of, to a, a wedding day without uh, finding out that the state was asking for more and more and more along the way. Uh, our wedding ceremony uh, went off pretty much as we had planned it, um, with a lot of emphasis on the spiritual basis, mm -hmm. our personal uh, relationship, love for each other, uh, friends and family surrounding and witnesses there. Uh, but when it came time to declare us married, I was somewhat stunned when the pastor said, by the power vested in me, by the state of Oregon, I now pronounce you man and wife. All of those other elements to what was really behind our marriage and our understanding suddenly was set aside, and yeah. it was the state of Oregon, <laughs> front and center, <laughs> saying, okay, uh, yeah, we, okay, uh, now you're married, yeah. we said so. Yeah. So, yeah, well, that's a pretty and, good reason and, to get and involved. And as time goes by, I, I doubt that any married couple uh, fails to notice the um, way that the state inserts itself in family life today. Um, and I've been concerned about many of the issues related to staying free and independent. Mm -hmm in this country, and um, I came across, um, during some personal law study, Renee, uh, the definition of a license, uh, which is that uh, a license is permission by an established authority to do what would otherwise be illegal. So in other words, your license mm -hmm. says, okay, now you two can go cohabitate because if you did it without this little piece of paper from the state, that would be illegal. Right. Oh. In other words, it would be <laughs> illegal for us to have married unless the state said unless so. Unless the state said so. And, th and that was eye-opening. Right. Um, and a little research and uh, uh, just looking into it further. And, and I realized that what had always been a right and frankly, marriage pre-exists any civil government. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, marriage is, is the concept and was instituted by the Creator, God. It was His idea. And people have been marrying, and I guess they never knew it was illegal until <laughs> Caesar came along. But uh, uh, the point is, uh, we... We have a three-part civil contract through the marriage right. license. And could you just explain to me, this marriage, this concept of having the state involved in marriage, has not, it's not been around all that long. That's how right. did How did this all mm -hmm. of a sudden move from jumping over a broom, in some cases, or going to the local church and signing a book and you're married, that's all there is to it, to all of a sudden the involvement of the state. How did this all happen? Well, uh, we can go through some history, and we should. Um, but frankly, uh, the trends, and more citizens need to become aware of this, that the state is progressively extending itself into every possible area of life at the expense of our individual freedom. And uh, unless it's stopped, uh, we will find it doing things it never did before uh, on a continued basis. And its involvement in marriage is that way. Um, mm -hmm. Because it was allowed, because the state was allowed by us uh, right. to position itself this way, right within the family structure of husband and wife and children. Uh, hey, it's happy to do it. And now it tells us that, uh, that we can't marry without its permission. Uh, marriage, of course, uh, started with, with Adam and Eve. Right. But, I mean, yeah. the, the thought of yeah. having a license. Now, I was oh, told okay. one thing, uh -huh. uh, that it had something to do with after the Civil War, one of the things that they went mm -hmm. thought about was, oh, beauty, let's try and keep track of any black people who marry white people. Mm -hmm. 
And so okay. we'll keep track of that by issuing a license. Is well, that, is that, that true? That is true. However, okay. even prior to the Civil War, and if we're going to talk about American history, uh, I'd like first to mention that uh, uh, marriage, of course, started with Adam and Eve, with God deciding that the proper mate, uh, uh, he created a woman for the man, and, uh, and marriage began. Uh, down through early history, we see that marriage uh, uh, was conducted by families. Families agreeing, okay, I have a daughter, you've got a son. Right, so they kind okay. of agreed between yeah. themselves. Yeah. No you ceremony, know. No, no, cere no civil so authority. Originally, there yeah. was actually not even a ceremony. Right. It was just kind of a contractual agreement yes. between people. Uh, and then right. intent to marry. Right. It wasn't just simple cohabitation, it was an intent to marry. Um, and uh, frankly, that uh, behavior for people joining together in marriage uh, right through the Middle Ages uh, was the norm. Right. Um, and that's all stations of life, yeah. whether, you know, you mm -hmm. were peasants in the fields or you were, you know, the king and queen. Right. So you, it's basically, you go to the book, you sign the name, you agree, mm -hmm. and everybody's Everybody's happy. Uh, and then, um, I think one of the first instances of um, law being established to uh, regulate marriage, uh, the Council of Trent, which was uh, the, the Catholic Church government, hmm. um, established that Marriage wouldn't be recognized unless a priest oversaw it. Oh, so that's the first... That I know of. The first yeah. beginning yes. of, okay, some kind of authority mm -hmm. has to sanction right. what you're doing, otherwise it's not legitimate. Right, and then for the Protestants, uh, the British uh, passed uh, a Marriage Act in uh, 1753 uh, that uh, said that marriages wouldn't be recognized in England, Scotland, Ireland, uh, unless uh, it was overseen by one of the Church of England prelates. Right. So, uh, well, common law or unlicensed marriages still were very much ongoing. We had the beginnings of um, authorities stepping in and saying, well, you know, we're going to take some control over this thing. Right. And uh, you're going to have to get our permission. But in the colonies, that Marriage Act didn't uh, apply. Uh, unlicensed uh, or common law marriage uh, was very much the case, uh, the norm, uh, and continued that way uh, right on uh, up until, uh, I would say, the 20th century. But licensing of marriage did exist in exceptional cases. Hmm. And prior to the Civil War, because um, some people weren't permitted to marry um, by the churches that oversaw, conducted ceremonial. Oh, right. So it was the church uh, right. saying, right. well, we don't uh, condone, like uh, yeah. Catholics and Protestants getting married. Right. They couldn't get married, right. so. Black's Law Dictionary uh, talks about uh, the marriage license with regard to those who wanted to intermarry. Now, suppose it was racial intermarry hmm. or, uh, or uh, different uh, religious faiths intermarrying. Um, if you wanted to do that, you were no longer in a place where you could get somebody to marry you in one of the churches. Oh, I and see. so the state issued licenses for that. Right. This is prior to the Civil War. After the Civil War, one of the uh, earliest cases is where a, a previous slave owner wanted to marry his previous slave mm. and needed a marriage license for that. And, um, and so we see the definition of a license being permission to do something that otherwise would be illegal. That's, right. that's how it got started. Uh, but today we have states now that have passed laws, uh, and most of them have just uh, come into being uh, and even the later part of the 20th century where the state is saying, without a license, without doing this our way, we will not recognize marriage. 
uh, in 2007, one of the states that had uh, not regulated marriage, forbidding people to marry uh, or to have marriages that were recognized uh, without license, uh, did that. Uh, Idaho was, uh, was the state in question, but today there are nine states and then also the uh, District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., where common law or unlicensed marriage is still available to the citizenry. All right. And with the, with the licensed marriage, one of the reasons, as I understand it, that they, they demand that you be, have your little license from them is if you go to the state and you need anything, like if you need food stamps or if you need um, social welfare or any of these things from the state, that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons that they demand that you, mm -hmm. you be married by their rules. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Right. And then that sort of goes on to how do businesses get involved in this? Because businesses have a choice to whether they're going to recognize a common law marriage or not. But a lot of them, like the insurance companies and things like this, demand mm -hmm. this certificate from the state. They won't take your word right. for it that you're a common law married mm -hmm. couple. Mm -hmm. The um, the trend uh, in modern life has been the centralization of all things. Right. And and of course, uh, if we're talking just um, basic constitutional principle, uh, where decentralization was our original plan in this country, mm -hmm. we never were supposed to have a federal government with so much power vested. Right. Uh, but we have arrived there. Right. What with insurance companies, as you mentioned, uh, uh, medical, hospital right. uh, programs, and uh, the Internal Revenue Service, uh, Social Security program, everything has gotten so tightly interwoven where anybody that uh, tries to maintain any independence in any area of life, even as simple as marriage. Right. Uh, suddenly finds that uh, all these uh, powerful uh, influences in their life are telling them, well, you better do it this way or you're... you're we can't recognize yeah. you and we're not going right. to make any exception for uh -huh. you. Now, you mentioned there were six states or seven states that... Nine. Nine states that out of, you know, 50 states that decided, well, we're still going to recognize this common law marriage. Could you kind of tell me exactly what does common law mean when you talk about a common law okay. marriage? What does that uh, mean? Another, another legal definition for common law marriage is marriage by habit or repute. And um, the states that uh, will allow uh, a man and a woman to marry outside of a licensing system and recognize it, um, those are the elements by habit. In other words, uh, the man and the woman uh, live together. Right. And is there any kind of like, is, or do different states have different lengths of time mm. that you have to live together? Uh, no, that's actually not the really? case. No, that's not surprised. the case at all. Uh, uh, I think a, a common misunderstanding, and I've heard it from a number of people, well, if you live together seven years, okay, you're married, common law. No, uh, there are different requirements legally set out in each one of these states that uh, we'll talk about, uh, and some of them vary a little bit. Some of them a little more technical, some are less technical. But uh, basically, there has to be an, an agreement to marry by competent people who can... Uh, because of their mental state and so on, and age, right. uh, actually give consent to marry, and that they're agreed to marry, and then that they cohabit, that they live together. And then thirdly, that uh, they tell the wider society, we're married. This is my so wife. So there's, there's just basically that's my husband. three things that you mm -hmm. need to do mm -hmm. to consider to be a common law marriage. So that's that's make an agreement between yourselves, mm -hmm. live together, mm -hmm. and then present yourself to the wider public as being a, quote, 
married yeah. couple. So that's it. Basically. Okay. Well, that's pretty basic. And yeah. we're going to talk more about that. I want to get into a little bit more about which states are a little bit more friendly and then find out from you also how does Oregon feel about common law marriages. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back in just a few minutes. We're going to take a break right now and we're going to go to a little roll-in. This is a controversial roll-in. I've had people tell me, I don't like it. I love it. So you make up your own judgment. I don't agree with everything in this video, but I do like the idea of presenting the ideas. I'm not afraid to present things to you that I may not agree with totally. This is called the Second American Revolution. But whatever you think of this video, I can guarantee that you're going to find something within this that is going to tweak your mind a little bit and make you think. So with that, we're going to be going to the Second American Revolution. When a silent majority allows their nation to lose its common sense, that nation is lost, and you are allowing them to take your country away from you. Is it common sense to adore the altar of multiculturalism? Read your world history. Not one nation has survived as a multiculture. It's the uniculture that is your strength. One country, one culture, one language. Is it common sense that 84% of the people want to make English the official language of America, but your majority political party espouses insanity, ignores the people, and says no? Is it common sense that 53 countries, mostly in Africa, have declared English to be their national language, and the party who declares we will unite you says, press two for Spanish? Is it common sense to adopt your new national religion of diversity, when the very word means disunity? We founded a country on similarities, not diversities. One country, one culture, one language. You cry out for unity, but is it common sense to continue to identify yourselves by your ethnicities and not your nationalism? White hyphen America, black hyphen America, Chinese hyphen America, Hispanic hyphen American, gay and lesbian hyphen American, the black caucus, the Hispanic caucus, the woman's caucus. You want unity? Change your language. Isn't it time once again we all became just plain Americans? Or is that too much common sense? Is it your new common sense now to stand up and cheer when a presidential candidate wants to hand over the health care system to that same government who has run Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and 12 other entitlement programs into bankruptcy? A government bureaucracy who can't run a railroad, your airports, secure your borders, or find 15 to 20 million illegal aliens? That same government that allows Islamic women to take their driver's license picture wearing a neck scarf covering their face because it offends their belief. What's next? Allowing the Ku Klux Klan wearing their hoods? Is it common sense to bankrupt the American Treasury? Fighting wars for countries whose silent majority won't fight for themselves? Your debt is now $9.4 trillion. Is it common sense to continue to give away $9 billion of taxpayer money to unfriendly countries in foreign aid, including $2 billion a year to Egypt, who votes against the United States 80% of the time in the United Nations. All this while your own inner cities crumble. 40% of your high school graduates can only read or write at a fourth grade level. You have to import people from China and India for your high-tech industry because you haven't got enough smart people in America. And New Orleans and the flood victims of Iowa continue to be forgotten. This is madness. Lay down your misplaced global burden and rebuild America first. You can't support the world while neglecting your own country. Are you unifying the country with common sense when both of your presidential candidates cry out, we must show compassion for the 15 to 20 million invaders from south of your border? But not one word of compassion for the overburdened American taxpayer who is forced to subsidize the invaders by paying over $250 billion of their hard-earned money to establish America as the welfare department of a failed, corrupt foreign country. Are you unifying your country with common sense by sending out your utility bills and your Social Security checks in Spanish? Legal and illegal immigrants have no incentive to learn your unifying language because you make it easy for them not to assimilate. How many of you write in big letters across that bill, English only please, and send it back? Stop bending over backwards to accommodate every other culture but your own. Is it common sense to allow your activist judges to ignore your history, your culture, your declaration of independence, and every other founding document to remove God from public life? 
and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, their creator, not the ACLU, not the will of the atheists or the anti-Americans that sit on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in San Francisco. Separation of church and state, yes. Separation of God from public life, never intended by your founding fathers. Is it common sense that the very political party who claims to be the party of the people and shouts, we will bring change, consistently stops all common sense legislation to secure your borders, establish workplace verification, and stop taxpayer money for illegals. They call themselves progressive global thinkers. We had another word for them in 1776. We called them traitors. This happened all once before. 232 years ago, it led to revolution and thousands of dead in the streets. It will happen again unless you take back America now. Join the grassroots movement of the second American Revolution, not of guns and violence, but pressure, pressure, pressure on your non-representing representatives who created these problems in the first place. This is the most important phone number in your democracy, the congressional switchboard. Pick up your phone every day, every hour if need be, and call your representatives and tell them in no uncertain language to listen to the silent majority or else be thrown out on their hind quarters. It's toll free and your taxes pay for it. Would you stand by and watch your family perish when you have the power to save them? Of course not. Then why are you doing that to your own country? 1-866-340-9281. Perhaps you allow all this destructive, uncommon sense out of a distorted notion of tolerance. Remember what Aristotle said, tolerance is the last virtue of a dying society. You are tolerating the behavior that is destroying you. This wine was once rich, highly desired, and admired. But when you dilute it with enough water, it stops being anything. Take back America now. Choose to be part of the second American revolution. Pressure, pressure, pressure. No presidential candidate, no political party can save you now. Only an aroused citizenry will turn this uncommon sense around. And he or she who does nothing now is helping them to destroy America. My name is Thomas Paine, and I approve of this message. I only hope to God you will, too. Welcome back to Freedom TV. I hope that got your blood boiling a little bit in one direction or the other. At least you can consider yourself awake now. And we're going to talk some more about the unlicensed marriage. And I'd like to get into some of the state's and what they do in regard to giving people the option of having a common law marriage. What are some, what are some of the things that the states do, and, and how do you go about having this kind of a relationship? Well, uh, I have downloaded, and other uh, of your viewers can do the same thing very easily by going to common law marriage and doing a search. Uh, you'll find many websites come up and uh, among them the different states mm. that uh, provide uncommon I mean <laughs> excuse me uh, common law marriage right uh, we'll have affidavits such as this one from Ohio okay so this is like a, this is I'll hold this up and people can look at this mm -hmm. it's an affidavit if we can get a, a it's not a license on. it's not a license no. it's an affidavit and it basically says that what it's you agree to certain things, mm -hmm. and that's about it. You're and telling so the state you're married rather than the state telling, telling you, you you're married. married. Yeah, yeah. and then, then right down here at the bottom, right here at the bottom, it does have a place for a notary public, mm -hmm. which is on just about any kind of an agreement you have anywhere, and it's basically saying yes, I certify that these people mm -hmm. are who they say they are, and they did what they said they did. Right, and. Um, I think it's important that Ohio, which provides the option for people to marry outside the licensing system, mm -hmm. also for those who are choosing the marriage license route. Mm -hmm. uh, the state of Ohio produces a little pamphlet for the uh, uh, people who are engaged and heading toward their right. uh, marriage ceremony and pursuing the marriage license. Uh, Avenue. Uh, and in this little pamphlet, the state of Ohio informs the man and the woman 
that uh, this civil contract that you're entering into with the marriage license is actually including three parties. You know, when so people marry, they think, well, okay, there's the two of us. Yeah, right. You know, there's, there's Tom and there's Sally. Yeah. But the state says, please understand, there Can are I three parties to this yeah. marriage, the state of right. Ohio. so Ohio <laughs> actually tells you yeah, that. right. That's interesting. You're marrying the state of Ohio. Oh, and, not a good idea. <laughs> and uh, guess who the boss party is? <laughs> yeah. Now, <laughs> so, I want to see this. I, I, I would like to just read some of these, uh -huh. some of the questions. And basically, it's, it's the three yeah. things you said. We are domicil domiciliaries of the state of Ohio. Okay, we live there. We have mutually consented and agreed to be married. Okay. We are aware of no facts or circumstances that would prevent our marriage from being recognized under Ohio law, including, but not limited to, prior marriage of either party that did not terminate in death, divorce, or dissolution. Fair. <laughs> you don't want to be bigamous there. We have lived together in Ohio as husband and wife since, and then you tell them. Complete only if applicable, we started living together as husband and wife. And the last one, we are generally treated and reputed to be husband and wife in the community in which we reside. Very, mm -hmm. very simple. Mm -hmm. In other words, the three basic things right. that you said, and you're making a statement to the mm -hmm. state yes. that we're now married. Okay. And that's all there is to it. So those who uh, are looking toward marriage and want more freedom and less of the state being involved in the uh, basic uh, conduct of their marriage, um, in Oregon, you may not. Oh, really? You may not uh, initiate a common law marriage, but the state of Oregon will recognize an unlicensed yeah. common law marriage instituted in one of the states that does make it available. Oh, so, and, uh, so if you states, want a common law marriage, mm -hmm. you have to go out of state into right. another state, let get me, married, and then come back. Let me list okay. those states. Alrighty. Alabama, Colorado, Iowa, Kansas, Montana, Rhode Island, South Carolina, Texas, Utah, and the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C. Right. Uh, and uh, like I you know, showed with this one affidavit from o Ohio, there's something similar from Texas available. Right. And uh, I, I think that if citizens understood that uh, because our Constitution makes one state's laws uh, of necessity respected in other states right. uh, that an unlicensed marriage obtained in Texas, for instance, mm -hmm. will be recognized right. in Oregon, even though Oregon would not allow you to begin a marriage and have it be recognized right here. within the state right. of Oregon. Do you have to, if you are uh, have a common law marriage from another state, to be, to be recognized here in Oregon, do you have to file some kind of thing with the state? Well, it wouldn't hurt. It wouldn't hurt to inform the state of Oregon of your marriage. So you would just like photocopy your affidavit mm -hmm. and say, send it mm -hmm. in and say, right. you know, this is, we're married as of the laws of Montana or Texas or wherever you're And wanted. all states recognize an unlicensed marriage that has been initiated in one of the states that permits it. So that's still mm -hmm. on the books. They mm -hmm. still at least mm -hmm. recognize it. Right. Well, that's interesting. Okay. But fewer all the time, Renee. Really? Um, Idaho used to have uh, the unlicensed marriage available. Uh, they do not any longer. Really? Um, Pennsylvania as well. And, uh, and so it's a closing window, and that's disturbing. Right. Because something that was a clear right now is being reduced to a permission slip. A permission slip. So, then, so it's, not an, it's not a good thing at all, the, no. the licensing of marriage. It's actually a usurping of the rights of the people by our civil government. Right. And also with the licensing, there are certain things, particularly here in Oregon, I know, that you agree to by signing mm -hmm. that marriage certificate. And it's of getting course. more and more odious every year mm -hmm. because they keep piling on these laws that people don't even know they exist. 
they don't even know what they are, but all of a sudden you find out, oh, by agreeing to be married, I also agreed to half a dozen laws over here. Well, and you, and you are agreeing to any number of different bureaucracies being able to just show up at your doorstep and have automatic entry to check out, uh, hey, uh, how are you guys doing? Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, uh, seriously. Yeah, seriously. In the raising of your children yeah. and, and the handling of things, uh, uh, the state of Oregon, as well as any other state that licenses marriage, they are uh, reserving for themselves all kinds of prerogatives to enter into that marriage and exercise their will. Uh, right. and, and so it's something really disturbing. And, and divorcing the state um, is something that more people who are currently married with a license should consider. Right. My wife and I are looking at what do we do now that we have this marriage certificate from the state of Oregon. Yeah, that is a question. What if you <coughs> have a certificate? How do you back out of this arrangement? Well, the first thing that we're going to do is to, on a trip that's coming up in May, uh, go to, we're going to Alabama. We're going to go ahead and uh, file the affidavit because we'll be living there. We'll be cohabiting there. Uh, okay. We're going to make it plain and in every way. In fact, uh, take out a little public notice in the newspaper. Right. Okay. And, and, you, and you don't have to, there's not like a time limit. It's not like, a, oh, you have, no. to be, you have to be cohabitating for two and a half mm -hmm. months or something. So right. as long as you're together and you're cohabiting and you take out a notice in the paper, hey, we're living as husband and wife and we want everybody to mm -hmm. know that, then that satisfies the agreement for Alabama. Right. And you can get a common law mm -hmm. certificate there. And, and all states do uh, uh, provide uh, recognition right. for, you know, any of the things that, that they uh, give in the way of... Um, uh, powers, uh, abilities to people who have their marriage license, they're also required to uh, yield and give to people who have uh, a common law marriage, a common law marriage that's instituted in another state that permits it. Right. So, right. Um, we're, how, we're just going to go step by step with it. Right, and see but, how that but works. But we're very sad that we have fulfilled the that old German proverb we go to too soon old and too late smart. Yeah, yeah too soon old and too yeah. late smart. Yeah, because now you've got to back out of that mm -hmm. thing. Well, we're going to come back, and when we come back, I'm sure some of the people in the audience will have things that they want to ask you questions about, Very which good. are great. And we're going to take a short break and go to another roll-in. This one is called Demographic Winter, which is kind of an interesting idea and look at this concept of overpopulation. There are some areas where overpopulation is not the problem. In fact, the problem is people are disappearing. Whole cultural groups are just going away because there's not enough people in the area to sustain them. So we have a look at this really interesting video clip of a full-length movie. It's called Demographic Winter. The Romans, in the time of Julius Caesar, were totally preoccupied by the fear that they were not producing enough children. These are still uh, pagan nobility died out with them, their ancestors' idea of Rome. No one wanted to have any children, and no one wanted to get married. catastrophically falling birth rates, well below the replacement level. It's entirely possible that the French will disappear. There will be no native-born French that come from the traditional French uh, population. What some call the demographic winter of Western societies. It's happening in rich countries, it's happening in poor countries, it's happening in Catholic countries, Islamic countries, and that is everywhere uh, people are having fewer and fewer children. Never in history have we had economic prosperity accompanied by depopulation. When there are 
many too many old people and not very many young people to work and to look after them, which is what's on the books now. Um, mathematically speaking, you're going to have economic collapse, there won't be enough people to run the trains or pay the taxes. For those of us who uh, were raised to believe in the teachings of Thomas Malthus or Charles Darwin, for example, these trends are very hard to absorb. And for such a small nation as Latvia, it might even endanger the, the survival of the nation. The only way you can sort of preserve the theory is to say, well, certain kinds of human beings are on the way to extinction. Now we have 40 years of social science that makes it absolutely clear that the deterioration of marriage, the encouragement of sexuality outside of marriage is just not, it's not good for society, women, children, or men. On every measure ever measured by the social sciences, the intact married family is the strongest on every outcome ever measured. We as the policymakers think that the best way um, to improve the demographic situation is by strengthening the families. It's also true, I think, for people who are worried about women's rights, about their gay rights, about environmentalism. All of these movements are deeply informed by a 1970s era preoccupation with the so-called population bomb. Welcome back to Freedom TV, provocative, and I hope you have an opportunity to explore this idea that maybe the idea of overpopulation is not exactly accurate. Well, we're here with Bob Ekstrom, and we're talking about the unlicensed marriage and how to divorce the state, mm -hmm. which is great. And oh. I, I, I did have a question I wanted to ask you. How does a common law marriage work if you're having like a prenuptial agreement, say one person yeah. has a whole lot of property? Uh -huh and another person doesn't. And if people have questions, if you have questions to Bob, please do call in. The numbers will call up here on the screen and you can get a call in and, and ask Bob whatever question you want to. So tell me a little bit about that. How does that work together? Oh, okay, uh, prenuptial agreement. Um, I see no reason why such a thing uh, couldn't be part and parcel so long as it was written out and right. agreed to by the two parties. Right. Uh, regarding their own um, entry into marriage without the state. I see no problem with that. Uh, divorcing the state, always a good thing. <laughs> anytime anytime <laughs> we can. Anytime uh, you can. Any, any, way, any way you can. Any way we can. Yeah. But uh, on that word of divorce, people don't marry to divorce, first of all. They marry to be together. And I, I think it's important uh, to recognize, and, and I saw this in my research, that um, the marriage licensing, regardless of what state, they all seem to have it, uh, have prenuptials in the licensing uh, dealing with the dissolution of the marriage and providing for when the, uh, there's See, divorce. Yeah, I always thought that was And, and since really we've strange. had licensing as the norm, Renee, the divorce rate has gone <laughs> through the roof because you're providing for it ahead of time. Yeah. Uh, with an unlicensed marriage, with a common law marriage, there's no provision for divorce. If you want to divorce, well, you certainly can divorce, but you, you have to then break some legal ground to do it. Right. And I think we have a uh, call. Do you have a, a question for Bob? Yes, I was wondering, you talked a lot about the state's relationship uh, with common law marriage. What about the uh, federal government? So many things with all these entitlements and uh, the tax system and everything is all entangled in that whole whether you're married or not issue. Okay, you're on the way. I did not hear that. Oh, okay. It was talking okay. about what What about the federal government? How is it? You talked about the state being involved in mm -hmm. the marriage. Is, is yet the federal government a fourth party to the marriage? <coughs> 
Uh, no. No. Not, uh, not that I, as far as I know. But uh, the federal government, through its revenue collection system, the IRS, uh, yeah. they actually uh, are, are quite happy um, to have you inform them that you're married, uh, common law, licensed, unlicensed. They don't care just as long as you file that return <laughs> and check off that you're married. Check it off. They, they don't ask you to verify via state license number or any of right. a distinction. So they're uh, not uh, really yeah. interested in having verification that you're married mm -hmm. as long as you say mm -hmm. you're married and they can tax you appropriately. And, and then the... Um, federal uh, code uh, for taxes. Frankly, uh, people who are cohabiting pay l pay less than people who are married. Oh. So they're happy to have you be married. You pay more. There's a marriage penalty. <laughs> There's a marriage penalty. Yes. So do you, is it, uh, now also uh, what I like to talk about is with children. Now mm -hmm. in a common law marriage. Is there anything different that people have to do when they have children, or is you know like custody of the children, or um, you know responsibility of the parents, um, okay. rearing of the children? Okay. How does this work? Good point. In <coughs> fact, this is one of the reasons that um, I became very interested in the whole matter. Um, in the raising of children. With the marriage license, um, the children are actually acknowledged up front when you sign your application for a marriage license. It's, it's acknowledged up front that the children forthcoming from the marriage are, are the charges of the state. You're inviting well, the state to, <coughs> in, in, in acknowledging the state's authority, to oversee the raising of your children, that you're doing it their way. That, they're, that you're meeting their approval. Uh, now, in today's overweening bureaucracies, I wouldn't say that even couples that don't have a marriage license are immune from having uh, oh. the State <coughs> Department of uh, Health and Human Services Children Division show up and say, okay, hey, where uh, what are you somebody doing said are you something doing? about yeah, something, and we're here to check it out, and, here check uh, it out. and here right. we come, and we're taking your children away, and, and we're, when we've cleared everything up to our satisfaction, we might uh, bring the children back. Right. This could still happen, but you haven't signed on to it like you did through right. the, so the actually, marriage license. Right, so with the marriage license, there's mm -hmm. a provision. Oh, yes. oh, I'm going to have to go back and read oh, what yeah. we signed. Oh, yeah. But you are inviting the state of Oregon to be a an active, involved part of your marriage. Uh, you, you just got to take a look at it as a legal document. It's a civil contract between, like the state of Ohio says, three right. parties, uh, Tom, Sally, and Ohio. Yeah. And if the state of Ohio is willing to actually tell you that mm -hmm. up front, that's a pretty good indication that yeah. it's true. Whereas, in, like yeah. in Oregon, especially with jury nullification, they don't want to tell you about that either. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things in Oregon that they don't want you to know so they just don't bother telling you. And right. that apparently is one of them. And especially with the children, that's interesting. I didn't have any idea that oh, yeah. it actually mm -hmm. brought in the children and, to that degree. In the state, uh, through the marriage license and, and the laws surrounding it, reserves its authority to divide up property uh, when there is a, a separation, divorce, and so on. And so the state yeah. it can actually step yeah. in and say, oh, well, yeah. okay. you know, we don't like how you're separating, you're yeah. dividing up the property. Right. We kind of want to have a exactly. say in how it's exactly. done. Uh -huh. Whoa, that's kind of yeah. heavy. So you are literally inviting the mm -hmm. state as a third partner. You in this. are protecting your freedom and your rights in a huge way when you do not use the marriage license for marriage. Right. This is, I don't know, you could look at this as a form of bigamy. <laughs> because you're inviting a second person well, yeah. into the marriage. <laughs> you know, right. It's like bigamy or divorce the state. Yeah. And, and but, it's not, but it's not funny. It no. Is, it's tragic. I'm joking about it, yeah. but seriously, it's, it is it's, not it's funny. tragic. Yeah. It's a very tragic thing. So and, and people <laughs> find out about the tragedy too late. Yeah. Uh, they, they say, oh, well, yeah. marriage license, I guess this is what we have to do. But then when issues come up down the road, it's too late. It's, it's too like late. joining the army. Yeah, it's You've signed late. away yeah. your freedom. Now, is there a particular age 
that you can enter into common law marriage, or is it like 16, 18, you have to be 21? Well, the age of consent, uh, as designated in various state laws, uh, applies. So it would be individually you know, for you, you wouldn't each. You wouldn't be considered uh, of the maturity to legally agree to marry um, unless you were 18 years old um, in virtually any state. Right. So Alabama, is that true? Because I thought Alabama was, was, it was uh, that 16. May, that might be yeah. different, but... Um, in order to have the recognized common law marriage, you have to meet that number one step that you are competent to make such an agreement. Right. So there might be a problem, say, mm -hmm. we just have a couple minutes left, I think about one minute, but there might be a problem in doing a common law marriage, say, if you had one person who was uh, judged by the state as being mentally incompetent. Correct. That might be a oh, yes. real oh, yes. block uh -huh. to it. Uh -huh. Okay, so there are things that you have to fulfill and, and, and hoops you have to jump through, but apparently it's a lot less mm -hmm. than signing the marriage certificate. Well, Bob, I really, really want to thank you for coming and explaining this to me it, because it's been something that I've had a real great curiosity about, and you've really kind of opened up the door to mm -hmm. realizing... <laughs> Gee, it's not all the fun and games that it was thought out to be and that fulfilling the requirement of being married mm -hmm. by the state to fulfill other requirements may not be the best option. So thank you again for coming and sharing well, this with us. you're welcome. It was a pleasure. I thank really appreciate you. it. Well, thank you for being with us on Freedom TV. We had a good show today, and we're going to have an e a, a better show than you can possibly imagine next week. It's going to be a, another local organization that's very, very well thought of in the eastern districts out there. It's called My Father's House. Very unusual people, very, very dedicated. So join us next week on Freedom TV. Thanks for being here. For my country, for the pain that it's been through, she's been made to suffer for the profit of a few. Stone clouds are our foreman. Winds of change now touch our shores. Our youthful fathers are crying as the dreams been cruising. Let's go.